What is up, BBN, and welcome to the OTH Kentucky podcast. Today is our very first episode ever, and it is with an extremely special guest, uh, former Kentucky center and BBN legend, Josh Harrelson played a couple years in the NBA and has been spending the rest of his professional career playing overseas. Um, I just want to let you guys know beforehand that there is a little bit, we did have a little bit of an audio lag issue, so at times it may sound like Josh is interrupting me while I'm asking questions, but that's actually not the case. We just had a little bit of a lag issue after the um, audio was recorded. There's nothing we can do about it, so I just want to let you guys know that if there, if if we do talk over each other, it was not on purpose. It's just due to that lag. Also, the interview starts off a little abruptly with me immediately asking a question because of that audio lag. I had to cut out some of the uh, you know earlier stuff. So yeah, this episode is with Josh Harrelson. It's a great interview. He's an awesome guy. I really pre- appreciate him doing this with me and i hope that you guys enjoy this go big blue um i just wanted to know if it was true that you never played basketball before your uh, freshman year yeah of high school. i never really played organized basketball uh i had like a hoop in my front yard that was probably like eight and a half foot tall i used to just joke around with my friends out there and stuff but uh yeah I, I played baseball my whole life growing up so that was kind of the sport i stuck to and then uh when i got to high school everything changed yeah, and I, I guess the development over those four years in high school was pretty crazy because, you know, you went from that, you know, never playing basketball before to, uh, you know, being a collegiate basketball player within the span of four years. At what point, you know, did you realize that you could play high-level um, basketball? Probably going into my senior year. Uh, you know, my junior year, I was getting recruited. I still wasn't the best I could be, but I was getting better every single year for only being, you know, two and a half, three years into playing basketball um but then going into my senior year uh, I had a good senior year uh, I played well um and then kind of after my senior year I was playing against guys like Alex Tyus who went to Florida I was playing against a few other guys around the area that were pretty good players and well known and I was I was playing against those guys and I was committed at the time to Western Illinois University and after playing these those guys I was like why am I going to the smaller division one school when, you know, I'm playing just as good as these guys, if not better, like I can definitely play at a better school. Yeah. And after your after you were released from your letter of intent with Western Illinois, you uh, went to JUCO. And I just wanted to know, you know, how was the junior college experience? Because most people say that JUCO is a really crazy grind and, and it's really a um, tough situation to be in. I mean, you know, they gave me a place to live. Um, you know, they uh, school was free. Uh, you know, growing up the way I did, you know, if somebody provided food and provided for you a place to live and something was free, you know, you had to take, you had to take full advantage of that. So uh, going there, it, you know, it was, it was actually better than what I was used to having. So um, it, it was tough though. Um, it was, it was a tough situation, but, uh, you know, I went to amazing school. Uh, I had a great coach. I think he has 900 career wins to this day or something like that. He's a, he's a phenomenal coach. Uh, and, you know, he put me out there and I got better every day being under his coaching staff and I started getting recruited by a lot of schools. And once you got out of there and uh, started getting some other uh, offers and everything and uh, you eventually chose Kentucky, what exactly was it that made you made you choose? Uh, I really wanted to go to Missouri because I didn't want to leave home um, and that Mike Anderson just took over there. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to stay home and Mizzou is only uh, – hour and a half from my house so uh, but they had they are use all their scholarships up so I didn't even take a visit there uh, but you know when I went to Kentucky uh, just the fans man uh, everybody was just you know chanting your name and everywhere you went everybody knew who you were and uh, I was just there on my recruiting visit and it was just crazy and the love and the support the fans showed me which that's really what made my ultimate decision yeah oh, man that's awesome to hear uh, now I read about a situation in your freshman year that I was just really curious about. Um, is it true that Coach Gillespie made you ride the bus home on an equipment yeah, van in that, your first uh, year at Kentucky? It was it was an interesting thing. You know, we were playing Vandy away, and I think Coach Gillespie he was just really upset. Obviously, that uh, Patrick wasn't playing. Patrick Patterson he rolled his ankle. I think the game prior or in practice that week, I can't really remember, but I know he set out the game, and Coach Gillespie was just kind of frustrated at the whole situation and. Uh, you know, I don't know what, I don't know why he took it out on me or, you know, whatever else, but yeah, we were just at halftime and he was like, I'm not, we're not going out of this locker room until Josh gets out of the locker room. And I don't know why he picked on me or whatever, but, uh, Jody and Pat told me like, Hey, Josh, just go, you know, go in there. So I, I went 
the, the only other room was the bathroom. So I just walked out of the locker room and walked into the bathroom. And then, uh, yeah, after the game, he made me ride the equipment van home with the, with the managers and the equipment trainers. But, uh, you know, it wasn't that bad. Uh, you know, Coach Gillespie, he was a little crazy. Um, but I, I, have to, I have to give him credit for being, you know, the toughness he instilled in most of his players. Uh, you know, he liked to break his players down and rebuild them. Um, but you know, I like going back, I don't think Kentucky wins that national championship without Darius Miller. Uh, you know, and Darius got so strong and so tough and that's why he's in the NBA to this day. I think a lot of it is because coach Gillespie gave him that toughness and that grind mode. Well, and it's got to take a lot of uh, mental fortitude, you know, especially as a freshman in college to, to have something like that happen and to just continue and to plug on and, and, you know, shake it, def- it off it and definitely keep was. playing. Um, you know, like, like, yeah, after, after playing for Gillespie, like I, thought I could I just thought I could accomplish anything I put my mind to because he gave me that mental toughness even to the day you know like stuff that other people think might be hard or might be tough I look at it as you know it's not that bad and uh you know I got to commend him on that uh for giving me that kind of will and strength yeah absolutely it seems like you know stuff like that proves that there's a lesson to be learned in in every situation uh, no matter how tough it is um but once Coach Cal came to Lexington, I was wondering, you know, how did you feel about him in comparison to Coach Gillespie? And, you know, how, how did you um, feel about the coaching change at the time? Oh, uh, I think we all kind of knew Gillespie was going to be out of there, um, you know, especially after going to the NIT for the first year. And I think it was like 17 years. I think Kentucky had the longest streak. Um, uh, so I think we all kind of knew Gillespie was going to be out of there. But when Coach Cal came in, uh, I just didn't know what to expect. You know, I knew I knew he was bringing his own guys in. Um, I didn't know who he was going to keep around and who was leaving. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ended up leaving. Um, but I don't I don't know what it was that why he kept me around. Uh, but, you know, I was very thankful that he kept me there. Yeah, well, that, that was actually my next question, because um, a few players did end up leaving once Cal got there. So I was wondering if you ever considered transferring, if you were just, you know, 100 percent forward with uh, uh, being a Kentucky. Yeah, man, like, you know, like that goes back to Juco about, uh, you know, Hey, you know, Kentucky's paying for your school. You're living in a great place. You're getting fed two meal, three meals a day. Like, uh, there's not many better situations than that. Uh, you know, I'm getting a free education. So, if, you know, if everything works out the way it's supposed to be, I'm gonna have a degree. I'm gonna be fed well. I'm gonna be a Kentucky Wildcat forever. And uh, you know, that speaks more volume than leaving, transferring, and maybe potentially playing somewhere else. But if if you're not going to the NBA, you know, I would rather have that Kentucky degree and that Kentucky pedigree than, uh, you know, than transferring out and playing somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I was wondering if as a player who played for both situations, you know, uh, a kind of a more of a losing situation at, at first under Coach Gillespie and then immediately back to being one of the best teams in the country. I was wondering what the difference is that you maybe personally noticed between the two coaches that maybe uh, led to you know, Coach Cal getting more wins and 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 uh, things of that I would nature. Say the, the main difference between the two coaches is, uh, you know, Coach Cal obviously he he brings a lot better players in, um, but also Coach Cal puts players in situations that are going to make them look the best players they can be. Uh, Co- coach Gillespie, on the other hand, he's a very he's a very good coach when it comes to drawing plays, X's and O's in basketball but he's not a very good teacher and coach Kyle was a very good teacher and uh you know Kentucky is a tough job uh with it comes with a lot of a lot of other things you have to do besides basketball and not a lot of people in this world can do that job as well as coach Kyle can uh he's very great at what he does well absolutely that's that's uh it's always very interesting to hear you know uh, what the differences it are between the two coaches, because obviously it's night and day with the product on the court. So um, that's definitely cool to hear about. But uh, so you had a couple of good years of, of developing under Coach Cal, and then your senior year rolls around. And uh, I was just wondering, when you heard that Ennis Cantor would be ineligible, how did you feel knowing that you'd be starting for the University of Kentucky and knowing that you'd be, you know, the main option? Uh, I was excited. You know, it was my senior year. I put a lot of work in, especially that that summer before going to my senior year. I put a lot of work in. Uh, a lot of extra time in the gym, the weight room, running, conditioning, just trying to be the best shape I could be going into my last year of college. Um, but, you know, even when Ennis was ineligible, I didn't know if it was going to be me or Eloy or, you know, if they were just going to go Terrence at the five and kind of play small ball. So, you know, I didn't know I was going to be the starter until uh, kind of until the season started and Coach Kyle put me in there and I just kind of, I guess I just did what I was supposed to do and kept the whole spot all year. 
Right. Well, I mean, you were a massive part of that team and your grit and energy and passion for the game was a major factor in uh, in that cha- in that uh, final four run. So I was just wondering, you know, we you know, we have to talk about that inbound saving against Ohio State when you just pelted Jared Sullinger with the basketball. I, you do realize that that's one of the most badass yeah, things I've ever man. seen most, in a basketball most game. Most people right? I, when March Madness rolls around, uh, my Twitter just blows up with that uh, that video. Um, but yeah, it was just a, I think somebody missed a jump shot and I had rebounding position and I jumped up and got the offensive rebound and he kind of nudged me in the back and, uh, you know, I was falling out of bounds. And like I told you, I grew up playing baseball my whole life. So, uh, you know, I was just trying to save the possession and he was the closest guy to me. So my thing is, I'm, if I'm going to throw it off, you're not going to catch it. I promise that. So when I threw it, you know, it, I threw it as hard as I could and just hit him right in his <laughs> chest and. I think that was kind of the momentum turner of that game. You know, I think a lot of guys saw that and we just kind of got fired up and we just kept fighting. Yeah, man, I got to say that's that's definitely one of the more iconic moments, uh, especially under Coach Cal, that's happened. And I think that's a big reason as to why you're such a fan favorite is it's not only just because of that play, but most just because of the energy and the passion you you brought to the game and how you just you out toughed everybody on the court. And I, I, I do believe that that is big reason why you're right. so beloved. You know, I, I wasn't always. Or the fastest or the strongest, so I knew if I outworked and out out hustled everybody that you know my my game would show. And playing with all that energy and passion and emotion helped me to to play as hard as I could every single game. And and uh, you know to this day I still play with that, that same emotion, that same drive. And, and Coach Cal is uh, considered obviously one of the better developers of NBA talent. I was just wondering if you, what you think would have happened um, if Coach Gillespie had stayed there for three years, or if somebody, or for the rest of your three years, or if somebody else had been the coach. Do you think things would have ended up differently, or does stuff like that really play a, a factor? Into yeah, I think things would have like ended up differently. Um, you know, obviously they wouldn't have been, had the same talent in the in the locker room in the practice. Um, you know, every day in practice, I got better. I got to go against DeMarcus Cousins, Daniel Orton, Patrick Patterson. Uh, you know, then the next year, I got to, I, every day I got to go in against Ennis Cantor, who was one of the best centers in the draft class. So every day I'm playing against the best players in practice. So going into a game, like, I'm looking at these other guys, like, you're not better than Ennis. You're not better than DeMarcus. Like, these guys are not better than the players I play against every single day. So if I go out there and do what I do in practice in this one game, I know that I'll go out there and outshine them. Is there a particular player, like one who really stood out as the absolute best that you you remember playing with at Kentucky, or was everybody kind of around a, a similar skill uh, level? I would say everybody was kind of around a similar skill level. Um, you know, everybody brought so- something different to the table. Like when I saw John Wall, like his speed and his quickness and his athleticism was just crazy. You know, I've never saw players like that. And, and this was kind of before Instagram and all that was blowing up and Twitter was blowing up. So, that, you know, you really didn't even see these guys' videos like you do nowadays. So seeing those guys like first, like in person and seeing how DeMarcus, how big he was, how skilled he was, he could shoot, he could dribble, uh, you know, and then Patrick, Patrick was, Patrick was a beast. Like he would dunk on anybody and it was crazy how athletic he was, and how strong he was. And then coming the next year, having Ennis Cantor, uh, you know, his footwork, his his the way he used his body, his rebounding skills was just phenomenal. And Terrence Jones was just another great player, athletic, long, can shoot, can dribble. He's, you know, he's just he's a six nine two guard. You know, he can shoot, he can dribble, he can pass. And, uh, you know, just those guys that Coach Cal was bringing in, they were just such great players. Yeah, that well, that team uh, in your senior year got so close to winning it all that year. I was just wondering if you ever still think about just how close oh, you guys I, I got that sure. season. Uh, you know, we we all started playing basketball at the right time. Uh, we got all the way to the Final Four and uh, ran into a great team. You know, UConn was a great team that year. That was the only team that beat us twice when we had the redemption game. Every other team that we had redemption game against, we ended up we we beat them. So UConn beat us twice that year. Uh, you know, Kimball Walker was great. Jeremy Lamb was great. Uh, and those two guys, they were a great duo. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, obviously uh, pretty much everybody thinks that uh, that, that year the, the Kentucky-UConn game was the national championship because we all know that if it had been Kentucky against Butler, it yeah, wouldn't have that, been much of a I game. I tell everybody the same thing. I'm like, the, the national championship game was us and UConn. I mean, that was that was such a good game, and it came down to the wire. And, uh, you know, UConn, I think I, I believe VCU was in it. And, you know, those guys, they I don't think either of those teams could have handled either of us if it would have came down to the other side of the bracket but uh you know 
they got the best of us that game, and I wish it would have been ended differently because we would have won the national championship, but uh, they end up getting us. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on to your NBA career, um, you got drafted 45th overall in the NBA draft. How did it feel to hear your name called knowing that you'd be playing, you know, in the NBA, which is the, the best basketball uh, league in the I mean, world? It was crazy. Uh, I didn't, you know, I never expected that I'd be in the NBA growing up uh, and then going into college. You know, I, I figured, hey, I'll be overseas. You know, I'll do this. I'll do that. But, uh, you know, when when I started playing good in my senior year and all these people are, hey, you might you might get drafted. Hey, you're playing good. So going on my draft workouts, uh, actually, New, I, when I was in New York for my draft workout, a lot of teams didn't know I could shoot threes. Um, so when I went there and I was doing my draft workout and I had a really, really good workout, played great uh, against a bunch of guys that, you know, that were projected to be top 10 picks and top 15 picks. So uh, bringing all those guys in and I had a great draft or a great workout and played a lot better than a lot of those guys that were supposed to be top 10, top 15. Uh, that's why I think New York, you know, they put invested so much money in me to buy that pick from New Orleans. And it was just, it was just such a crazy feeling when I saw my name go across the screen surrounded by my family and friends. Yeah. Well, in your first career start with the Knicks, you dropped 14 points and 12 rebounds. You know, how did, how did it feel to have a game like that in your first career start? You know, did it, did it give you, um, you know, the confidence that you needed to, to continue on in, in that uh, league? It felt great. Uh, Coach D'Antoni had a lot of confidence in my game. Uh, you know, I was perfect for what he liked. He liked fours that would stretch the floor uh, and, and uh, just get out and run and defend. And, you know, that's what I did. And uh, it felt good to drop 14 and 12, especially going against Sacramento, playing against DeMarcus, how many times he killed me in practice. Uh, uh, it was nice <laughs> to go out there and get a win and go out there and get my first double-double my career. Yeah, well, in, in the NBA, you know, obviously it's a, it's a really tough business and it's really hard to stick around. Um, you know, how 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 difficult was it, you know, to, to hang around in the league for for as long as you did? Um, it was it was it was a little difficult, um, not too bad. Uh, but my first year, you know, I got traded um, to Houston and Houston had so many players on their roster they're trying to load up I think the, the Dwight Howard trade so at one time Houston had like 25 players on their roster and uh I knew I was on a non-guaranteed second year so I knew I was going to be one of the players that Houston let go and then you know I got I, I I got picked up by Miami right away um went down there made their team and then uh I think it was around middle of January maybe beginning of February uh I know they I knew they were trying to make some trades to get a big man um, to come in for the championship and then at that time I didn't I didn't know really know the rules so I ended up telling my agent you know because I was in the best shape of my life even even better shape than college so I ended up telling my agent hey you know I want to try my chances somewhere else nothing you know I want to go somewhere else because I knew Miami was gonna uh, I knew they were looking for somebody else so they ended up cutting me and signing me to a 10 day and then I thought you only had two 10 days for the whole NBA not per team so I ended up telling my agent, hey, let's take my second 10-day somewhere else, which I wish I would have known this rule when it happened, but I didn't know you got two per team. So um, Otherwise, Miami probably would have kept me, and I probably have a ring to this day. Yeah. Oof, man. Well, um, when it comes to players like you and, of course, former Kentucky player Terrence Jones, who I, I personally believe both of you guys could easily have a spot in the NBA right now, do you think situations like that are more just – in based off of the situation or is it because like Terrence Jones is, and yourself are just completely killing it overseas and Jones seems to be averaging double digit points and eight rebounds every time he, he is on an NBA roster why is it that guys like him are, are not able to uh, stay um, in the NBA it's I would say it's once you're in it's it's easy to stay in but once you're out for a year or two, it's hard to get back in. It's hard to get your foot back in that door. Um, you know, I know Terrence has had some issues in the past. Um, obviously, it's been all over social media and stuff like that. And I don't know if I don't know if a lot of teams are just scared to take that chance on him again. But I, mean, I think he's a great player. Um, you know, I, I always I believe in giving people second chances, uh, especially you know, especially when they kind of grow up and mature a little bit. He was young, and you know, people do dumb stuff when they're young and you know he's such a great player he could easily be on the NBA team to this day uh he has the NBA athleticism the NBA abilities and he's he should be an NBA player 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I, I mean, I still to this day think think you should be in the league. I think, you know, especially with the way you play, you would easily fit in on a roster, you know, as a great rebounder, a good scorer, you know, you can shoot. It's, that's exactly what the NBA needs. So uh, I have always wondered why why that's been the case. So, but I guess, like you said, once you're out, it's really yeah, hard to get back they're in. They're always looking, I guess they're always looking for potential, you know, like a lot of guys that like are, you know, seasoned vets, like Terrence would be a vet now, I'm a vet. You know, they, they don't really care about guys like that unless you're already in the league and you're sticking around. But yeah. if, if you're trying to get back in, I guess they'd rather take their chances on somebody that, you know, could possibly be a great player one day, which most of them don't ever amount to anything anyway. Right. Well, I mean, and when you look at the the landscape of the NBA, you know, I'm like, I don't know if you, you do, you know, do you know who Cristiano yeah, Felicio yeah, yeah, yeah. is for the Bulls? Yeah, it's like, I, you know, not trying to throw any shade or anything, obviously, but yeah, I see a guy like him and it, when he's on the court, it just seems like he's just not doing anything. And I just wonder why, you know, a guy like him is in and a guy like you is not. That's just kind of the stuff that goes through my head when I'm looking at it. I'm like, why is George not in <laughs> yeah. this guy's spot? I haven't, so, I haven't tried to get back but, in in the last five years. I kind of just gave up on it and I enjoy my life overseas now and I, I enjoy Japan. So I kind of gave up on the NBA. Do you think if you if you did try to and really just you know did what did everything you could, do you think you'd be uh, able to get back find in? Find a team that would give me some workouts um, and give me an opportunity, probably like a training camp deal, and give me a chance to make the team. Um, but you know, when you take that route without any guaranteed money, you're gonna lose so much money from overseas. And at this point in my career, it's kind of it it might be worth it. It might pay off, but I look at the bigger picture. You know, I got a family to provide for, so I look at it now. I'm like, hey, I got five more years maybe good years i would rather just make as much money as i can overseas and uh just take that guaranteed money instead of taking a chance for a maybe a maybe contract right and you're i mean you're doing so well over there it, it, i understand it makes a lot of sense um so for the last few years you've had a lot of success with a few different teams overseas you know how tough is it to play in foreign countries and how much different is the basketball scene in those other countries compared yeah, to the united I played states in china uh china was great um you know, the living situation is not the best. You're in a hotel. Um, but, you know, overall, it's a short season, so a lot of people go there. A lot of XMBA guys go there because the season is very short. Uh, you know, I've been to Europe. I've been to Latvia, which was, a you know, it's Eastern Europe, so it's dark and cold. Um, but, you know, the basketball was good, good players. I played in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a great league. It's summertime league, but it's great. Uh, a lot of great players, obviously a lot of – there's been some NBA players from Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rican re- league is very good. And then the last four years I've been in Japan, uh, Japan is great. Um, food is great. People are great. This It's the safest place I've ever visited. It's the, one of the cleanest places I've ever been to. Uh, I mean, you won't find a speck of trash in bathrooms on the floor. They're just a very, very clean and very, I guess, like well-maintained culture. Do you have a personal favorite place that you've played over the course of like your entire career? Like, is there a place you look back and you're like, okay, you know, that's, that's definitely like been the best place for me or, or is that your current situation or, you know, um, how do you feel about I, that? I would, I, I thoroughly enjoyed New York and Miami. Um, you know, they're like, they're kind of opposites, you know, New York and Miami, they're both big cities, but um, I would say I probably enjoyed Miami the most, uh, including the players I played with. Um, but just living there and just being able to be in the warm weather and the sun and the vitamin D and being close to the water and, uh, you know, waking up every day and seeing the sunrise and being on the water. It was just it was just an unbelievable place to live and play. And has there been, you know, a situation or a team that you've maybe had the most fun playing for? Um, most fun? Uh, I, it would Maybe I would say maybe Miami or now in Japan, uh, you know, the guys I play with in Miami, they were all great, even though they were such superstars, you know, they were just really down to earth people. And I actually got along with them really well. And they got along with me really well. And, you know, we became friends. Um, but, you know, also in Japan, Japan, I live in Osaka, which is kind of like living in like Chicago, New York, like in between those two cities, like that size. So, uh, you know, I'm in a great place, a great city. I live very close to downtown, and uh, it's just it's just an unbelievable experience. And do you still pay attention to, of course, Kentucky basketball or anything of that nature? Yeah, you still I still follow, follow the team. team. I try to keep up as much as I can. Uh, you know, being over 
being 14 hours ahead is kind of it's kind of hard to watch games and stuff because by the time I wake up, games are usually over. So I watch, I watch a lot of recaps. I keep up with a lot of stuff on Twitter and stuff like that. Well, that's awesome. Do you I, I now that you I actually didn't have this question ready, but I'm I'm actually kind of curious now. Um, how was it like practicing against guy those guys in Miami? Just that 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 super team. Uh, it was it was it was crazy going from New York to Miami. Uh, just being around LeBron, Ray Allen, D Wade, Chris Bosch, uh, you know, seeing how these guys work, seeing their work habits, their work ethic, uh, you know, how much time they actually put in the gym. Uh, you know, I mean, Ray Allen would go to the gym, I think, four hours before the game even started and go up there and get his whole routine in. And that was what he did. And I mean, just to just to see somebody that has invested 14 years into the NBA at that time to go that early to get his workout. And it was like it was just really unbelievable. Did any of those work habits translate over to you and you, you still do uh, that type of stuff you know, to this day? A, I was a second year player. So you kind of have time slots when you could go to the gym and get your warm up in. Um, but. You know, I, I see those guys, how they work, and I try to lead by example the same way. Uh, you know, I go during the season or every year, you know, I'm working hard. I'm trying to be vocal. I'm trying to lead by example as much as I can, just trying to take a few pages out of those guys' books. Well, the BBN still loves and supports you, and I'm happy to see you still killing it and finding success playing professional basketball. And I just want to thank you for, for joining this and uh, doing this with me. As a lifelong Kentucky fan, this is, this is definitely one of the cooler things I've ever done. So um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me and uh, answer my questions. And, um, hey, yeah, Tom, so thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. As always, man, go, go Big Blue. Go Big Blue. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. That was Josh Harrelson, also known as Big Jorts. And uh, we are signing out of the OTH Kentucky podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you.